Hi everybody, today is my one year anniversary book pogo fucking celebration video. Um, technically the first video I posted was in August, but I want to celebrate the day that I decided to start this channel because it was a special day. Um, I had just gotten the stomach flu, I was in Colombia by myself. And um, I'll touch on this more because I kind of want to reflect on the past year. But before I get into this video fully, I'm also so excited because I have my first partnership ever um, with a company that I'm actually a fan of, which is Tertulia. So I'll put something right there. Okay, I'm going to read this out loud and full transparency. I was asked to be an ambassador. I first tried out their service, like I put all my Goodreads data onto my Tertulia account, which was very simple by the way. Um, went through their site, loved the layout, loved what I was seeing because I was not seeing popular books that I recognized. Um, and I was seeing thoughts and opinions on books from people that I've never heard of and then of course like from celebrities and shit. So I was gifted the year membership and then a $25 credit to try it out. And once I did those things and I was very pleased with all of my experiences, I said yes, I accept, I will be an ambassador and I will talk about you guys at the beginning of a video. And I thought it was fitting to do it in this video because uh, a year ago <laughs> I would have never thought I would be receiving free books from anybody. So. Um, I'm just gonna read what I'm supposed to say because there's no way I'm memorizing it. If you become a member on Tertulia, which is $25 a year versus Barnes & Noble's $39 a year, and I will say that again, $39 a year for Barnes & Noble membership, $25 a year for Tertulia's online bookstore membership. So if you sign up for this membership, you get unlimited free shipping, 50% off your first book, and then 10 to 20% off all books thereafter. You can try out the membership and these benefits for 30 days and then cancel it if you want before you get charged. So it's kind of a win-win. If you don't wanna become a member and you don't wanna try the year membership, that's okay, I have an ambassador code. Um, so with my discount code, you'll get 20% off your first order, no commitment to the membership. Uh, but yeah, let's get into this. So the first thing I wanna touch on, going back to that day last year and where I was at. So I graduated university in May of 2023. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna apply for full-time jobs, get a full-time job move to a city, work 40 hours a week, make enough money to pay for a studio apartment and become an adult, right? And I was applying for jobs and I was applying for internships. I applied for every single Penguin Random House internship for the past like three years before graduating. I applied to every Harper Collins internship. I applied for every, like any book publishing internship I could apply to, I tried to apply to. So I was kind of in this weird phase where I wanted to hit the ground running and like maintain my academic momentum and continue learning and reading and like doing all these things that really made my life fruitful when I was living on my own at school. But then every single rejection email and every single ghosting from jobs and internships that I received was like, slowly chipping away at my fucking will to live and i said all right if i don't have a job by the time i graduate i'm gonna go to columbia for the summer and i'm just gonna vibe and be with my family without my parents but like be with my mom's family that is all in columbia and i'll figure it out after in my last year of college i took this class called how we became digital my professor was very um, adamant about the fact that if you were not going to put in the time and the effort you would not do well and it was about digital history so I was kind of like wait computers computers equals math and math equals something that I fucking suck at so maybe I should just drop the class I really liked this professor I thought he was great so I decided to stay in the class and to just try my best and through this class, not only did I realize that I was interested in technology in ways that I didn't even know I could be interested in, but 
I also was able to prove to myself that I had like the ability to step up to the challenge and rise to the occasion and do well in group projects and archival research and all of these things and like I can do hard things because up until that point like my communications degree was very interesting but nothing was very challenging for me so this but this kind of opened my mind to other career paths so I started thinking about archiving learning about media digitization and when I went to Colombia in Bucaramanga the city where my mom is from and where I was basically staying the majority of my time there um there is a cultural center called La Casa del Libro Total. And I'm gonna link the website in the description as well because it's a free resource. It's a free digital library. And the director of this center knew like one of my uncles, like my political uncle, he's married to my aunt. And they publish books in that same location. They have art exhibitions and all of these different things. So I was like, cool let me come and like try to do something like an internship type thing and basically like I talked to this guy we were on the same page I get there literally silence and then two weeks into my stay I had already done like a five day side gig working as an art exhibition guide at this um art fundraiser uh where I met a ton of amazing people a lot of them I'm still friends with so then finally this guy's like oh sorry it was my birthday I was out of town like come by so I go by and I'm so amazed by everything he's showing me and telling me once we get to chatting because he shows me um the functionality of the website and the amazing search functionality that it has we looked up Dostoevsky and then not only do his books come up in all of the different languages they have available, but you can also find YouTube videos at the exact timestamp where his name is mentioned, artwork inspired by him or with his name in the title. His concern for accessibility was very, very interesting to me. So all of this kind of tied in to what I had been learning in that class, um, as well as what I was thinking about in terms of media digitization. Uh, I also was on the phone with this guy who is in, out in California. He digitizes media on the side. Like you can see the theme here that I kind of have something I'm interested in and I'm talking to a bunch of different people about it, but nothing is really coming from it other than me just gaining knowledge and information. So I go to the Casa del Libro that one day right and I go where they publish the books and the director's like you can even come here and learn how to physically make books I don't have it here but he gave me a mini Don Quixote like the smallest published copy of Don Quixote that exists you can actually read the whole novel with a magnifying glass so then after that day he is like okay but I want you to tell me what you want to do here and I'm like I need direction like I said okay well I can do like the only skills I have are social media and marketing I don't know how to do anything else but I would love to learn this this and this he literally to this day has not messaged me back and I was feeling a type of way about it but I kind of moved on really quickly I was like well I'm still in Colombia for two months there's a rock climbing gym three minutes away from my apartment I'm eating good I'm with my family I'm spending time with all these people who I rarely see so I was very, very happy, but at the same time, I was still applying for jobs, like copywriting jobs, publishing jobs, literally getting rejected from everything. Finally, when the two months were up and I came back to the States, I was still employed at Target. Oh, sorry, but I missed the point that near the end of that trip, like facing all that rejection and feeling high-key despair at not knowing what was coming next and what I was supposed to do with my life, I like had that moment where I saw this video and I thought, wait a minute, why don't I do this? Like, it doesn't matter if 10 people watch me. I just want to be able to have a documentation of how I'm changing as a reader because I noticed books that used to be my favorite two years prior were no longer resonating with me the same way. I was slowly branching out and discovering new types of books, new authors, but I was in Colombia and I didn't have any books with me. And I said, all right, when I come back, I'm gonna start making videos. So that's why I'm like, I know August 20th is when I made and published my first video, 
but I had been waiting for that moment since like the 20th or 21st of July and I had been thinking about it and I was thinking about all these different videos I wanted to make and Book Pogo. If you guys want to know the origin of Book Pogo, it's basically that my Twitter handle uh, a long time ago, I wanted to change it to something unrelated to my name. I just was watching F is for Family. I love Bill Burr so much. So I said, all right, I'm gonna make my Twitter at, at Frank Murphy. And then I was like, mm, that's not, that's not it. So then my boyfriend and I were like, Bob Pogo is the funniest fucking character on that show. So why don't you do Bob Pogo? So I tried to do Bob Pogo and it's taken. So I'm like, well, I could just do Boob Pogo and nobody's gonna know what that is. And I like how all of the O's look. So when I was thinking about a name for my channel, I knew, okay, I could go the route and do like Valentina's books, Valentina reads, Valentina, whatever. But I said, wait a minute, why don't I just do book pogo like i want something that doesn't make sense but looks really nice is like the perfect length i love again i love the o's i just thought it was perfect so i even came up with that that same day so then when i came back here like i said i came back to target and the feeling of just going back to the place you've been working at since you were 16 is not, <laughs> especially, like I said, with all of the rejection, everything chipping away at my self-esteem, um, I came back and I felt like, damn, I didn't do anything. Like, I'm feeling even worse than before. So I said, all right, let me just get a job at Barnes & Noble on the side, like work two part-time jobs while I'm looking for a full-time job. And that way, um, I can work more hours at Barnes & Noble and be somewhere surrounded by books, learn about book publishing. So I applied, I got the job, and honestly, it wasn't all terrible. Like, I wouldn't even say it was terrible. <laughs> I got to take home a lot of advanced proofs, which was like the best part of the job. Um, the discount was 50% for books, and can you believe I only bought two books. I bought Life and Fate and Demons. But, um, so I was working there and I really liked when I was able to be on the floor for my whole shift and I sold books, I talked to people about books and then they put me at the cash register once I got trained for it and never moved me from there. So I became miserable because I was doing what I was doing at Target for less money. Now it's like October and I'm feeling despair and had zero direction. Like I hadn't even, I stopped looking for jobs too and I was like, what am I gonna do? So then um, I kind of hit this breaking point and I said, you know what, I'm going to go to Europe. And I know it's really random, but I had been talking to my uncle saying like, we should go to Amsterdam. Um, I have a family friend who lives there. Let's go together because I've traveled to Europe with him once before. He said, let me know whenever you want to go. I'm ready to go. Like he's retired, literally 70 years old. So I hit him up and I'm like, hey, thoughts on going? I saw the tickets were cheaper than tickets to go to Boston, which was my original plan. Um, I was gonna visit my boyfriend's sister and I love her and like loved going to Boston the first time we went. So I was definitely disappointed that it was $500 to go for five days. But then I saw tickets to Amsterdam, $430. He said, yeah, let's go. The next day we bought our tickets and our flight was for like the 26th of November. So I put my two weeks in at Barnes and Noble and I know they were kind of pissed the fuck off because I had been there for five weeks. Um, oh, sorry, my dog just rolled over onto the base of the selfie stick. So I called my mom's friend, her childhood friend from Colombia who has been living in the Netherlands for like 30 years now. And I'm like, hey, like, we're coming. And then she said, hey, like, all of the master's programs here are in English. Have you considered? And I was like, oh, really? Never thought of it. Because I did feel like maybe I want to go to grad school, but I didn't know for what. So then I just thought, okay, I'm going to look up the University of Amsterdam. Literally the first thing I looked up because it's the first thing that came to mind. And I found two programs that I really wanted to do. And I thought, okay, let me go first and see what the vibes are because I'm not just gonna apply and, you know, not having seen the school, not having been in the city. So then eventually the trip comes around and I got there and it was like, I was depressed when I got there 
thinking about how I would have to leave. And when we left the Netherlands, we went to Bruges. Um, I was like, wait, why is every cell in my body like asking me to go back to Amsterdam? Like, I need to go back there. Then we went to the UK and I was like, fuck this place. Went to Brussels. I'm like, please, like Amsterdam, Amsterdam. We finally get back to Amsterdam and Harlem. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do like everything humanly possible to get back here as quickly as possible. So then I come back from Europe and I'm like, you know what? I've been afraid to quit Target for so long because I'm comfortable here. They're lenient. Like, mind you, I had been away for two months and then away for three weeks in Europe and they didn't give me any trouble at all. I had known these people since I was 16. So I was having a really hard time letting go. But like with most decisions in my life, it's like I wake up one day and I just feel like, this is the only path that makes sense and the thing that I have to do right now. So I woke up on the morning of one of my shifts and I went in and I put my two weeks in. And then January, I started working at my dad's office. And of course, I'm super fortunate that I had that opportunity. It's been so wonderful working with my dad, working with my uncles, working with the women in the office. It's an insurance agency and in a way it's Kafka-esque. <laughs> um, but there is like actual proof that I have brought value and like benefit to a company since I started working there. And if we look back from like this point backwards, to how I was when I graduated college where I felt useless, like I didn't know anything, I didn't know what I wanted to do, to January, it's like, then I had a clear goal. I had the elation and happiness that you feel when you have a direction you wanna go in. Um, and I was fulfilled by my work for the first time. I mean, I'm basically doing social media marketing communications work, which I thought I hated. And it's not necessarily what I wanna do forever, but I was, and am because I'm still currently working there very very happy slowly it's like my confidence was built back up and like I am so joyful um I just like can't believe that so much has happened in a year and I wanted to look back and reflect on it I hope this wasn't annoying or borderline narcissistic because I am only talking about myself but um this is just what has been going on in my real life I feel like there's my life that I live and then my reading life and they're parallel to each other. This life, the reading life, is very internal and I think I've changed a lot as a person just from the books that I've read um, in the past three years but especially in the past year. So having this channel it also allows me to look back on all of this change and it's just like so wonderful and I'm so happy that I'm at a point where I don't really operate from places of fear or shame anymore. Um, I've seen a complete change in my life since I stopped doing that. So um, yeah, that is my one year of book pogo reflection. And I asked you guys to ask me anything that you wanted to ask and I barely got any responses, but I'm gonna answer the few questions that I got. So the first question is from Shakela, and I answer this question in the reading vlog that I'm currently editing right now for Life and Fate, but I'll answer it again here. The question is, I'm curious about when reading these bigger, denser books, how you go about keeping track of all the characters, especially like in many Russian novels where several of the characters have either similar names or multiple nicknames, which can make it hard to follow. I tend to take notes, but sometimes I don't like losing the momentum when I'm reading, so I forego, which I can cause or so I forego, which can cause some confusion for me at points. So my answer to this question is that I think Catch-22 is the first book that I gave up on for this reason. I was just like, not only do I have to remember who all these people are, but I also have to remember military shit that I don't know anything about. So that book kind of put me off and it wasn't until I really started reading Dostoevsky where I realized, damn, if I sit here and I try to memorize like who each character is, I'm not gonna get anywhere. I don't have any tips or explanations for how I overcame this. It was just that I like opened up my whole fucking brain, I feel like, and instead of focusing on exactly which name 
goes with who, I would just read. And then I would recognize like the shape of the word of the name. Um, and I would know like, okay, this M name is the person who this, this, and this happened to, who has this relationship and blah, blah, blah. So it was like with so much context that were given in the book, I was able to just focus on that. And it's like when you know a person but don't remember their name, but it's like you clearly like know your relationship to them. It was kind of like that. Then the second question is from Roger Dodger. Do you want to live in USA long term or in another country as an expat? So I don't want to live in the United States long term, I think. Um, I won't know until I've gone and actually lived abroad for a long period of time. And now going to Amsterdam for a year, it's like, I can't say for certain that I want to stay there because I haven't gone and lived there. But I also wouldn't be surprised if I wanted to stay there. I um, have always felt like extreme happiness when I've gone to Spain, for example, to visit some friends. Like every time I went to Europe when I was younger, I was the person that didn't want to come home. I'm like depressed that I'm going home. Why do I have to go home? Always dreamt of living there, living places where I can get around without a car. Um, and I don't think that is going to change anytime soon. But I wouldn't be an expat. I would be an immigrant. So Roger also asks for a song playlist. Um, I don't know exactly how to like share that, but I can link my Spotify in the description. Then the next question is from user jm1re7kj9j who asks i know you made a video months ago about this but i'm curious about your opinions on social media usage of those like tiktok instagram youtube and like influencer celeb culture consumption etc if you have any updates or things to say i'd love to hear these um as they are topics i am thinking about lately so Yes, one of my first videos that really brought a lot of people to my channel and like people that were interacting with me was my video about how I quit social media and became a better reader. In that video, I was still in the mindset that I was in for like two years or where I not only felt like I need to get off social media because I need to gain my attention span back and focus on things that are actually important, but... I felt genuine repulsion and disgust at using social media. I felt like, why would I perform? Like every single thing that's posted is a performance inherently. Like videos on TikTok where it's a girl in like the cutest outfit, like scream singing along to a song and like dancing and looking effortlessly gorgeous, effortlessly cool, not trying hard at all. I'm like, well, you still set up your phone, pick the audio, um, set it to the part of the song that would be best for you to film this video, film the video, watched it probably a million times, and then posted it knowing people are going to see it. Like the motivation is always to be perceived. And that, when that like switches in your brain, I could not any longer, like I deleted my Instagram fully. I do not have an account at all. And now that time has passed, I think it's been like Well, yeah, it's been three years without social media uh, aside from Twitter, but when I started this channel a year ago, I realized I was going to use TikTok again because it's the easiest way for me to make YouTube shorts uh, and have auto-generated captions. I mean, auto-generated subtitles. So I normally just delete the app once I've made my shorts, but of course it's like on my phone for a period of time and I'm back addicted like nothing um addicted to youtube shorts just like that short form content addicted to twitter again like full-blown fucking relapse aside from the fact that i don't use snapchat like haven't used it and i still don't have an instagram again and i will never probably make one again my thoughts are still the same like my criticisms are still the same but i'm kind of in a mellow period where i show myself like it's i'm more lenient um I just don't have that disgust or resentment for it anymore. So it's like, sometimes if I want to just fucking scroll on Twitter all day, um, I can't stop myself. And before it wasn't that I had to stop myself. It was just that I didn't want to do it, period. So 
as for influencer culture and things, I mean, I've seen a big turnaround in people trying to do like de-influencing and underconsumption core. But again, it's like something like that, then it becomes a trend and everybody wants to make the fucking video about how little makeup they have, how little this they have, how little that they have. And I think the root of my um, paradigm shift was realizing that nobody needs to see anything ever about what I'm doing. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm wearing the cutest outfit, if I look good as fuck, if I'm having so much fun, if I'm traveling. Nobody has to see anything and nothing will happen if I don't take pictures and post them anywhere. So thankfully I haven't relapsed fully, but I've definitely relapsed into my short form content addiction. Um, but I still read like, a good amount and can put my phone down so I'm not too concerned about it but that's kind of where I stand on it I still feel the same way but <laughs> I'm not as disciplined anymore so that diabolical bitch asks as a fellow reader books have changed me entirely from someone I was before they do shape your identity how do you look at the shift and which books caused that for you I think every single book that I've read has changed me in some way because uh, even if it's the smallest, slightest things, um, I thought about doing a video about this where I can pick up any book that I've read and even if I don't remember the plot, the name of the characters, and most of it, I still have an ability to remember small details or large details or just different things that stay with me from books. And an example I was thinking about was like a book that I read in middle school, which was called like Never Let Me Fall or Before I Fall or something where this girl basically relives the same day until she breaks the cycle. And in that book, she has a strained relationship with her mother and they have a big fight and she paints a red line with nail polish outside her bedroom door. And she's like, don't ever come into my room. And she paints this line. And she had done that when she was much younger. And as she's reliving her days, she obviously is like panicking, scared, and starts to feel more tenderness towards her mother and sees how she treated her unjustly. And it isn't until like one of the last days where I don't remember what was happening, but her mom finally steps over the red nail polish line and comes into the room and I remember it's like the nail polish line is chipped already and it's old and worn um and I think about that often I read that book like eight years ago so in the past three years I think what has changed the most is that I've gone through a lot of situations that have been emotionally difficult for me the typical things you go through when you're 20, 21, 22, where you just stop being friends with people, um, you have falling outs with people, uh, people do you dirty, but they think you did them dirty. And I think for the longest, like it was hard for me to move on, to forgive, to see any other perspective than my own. And as I, you know, basically went on a complete social media cleanse and dedicated my time to reading, even though I wasn't reading books that I currently love. Like I was reading Sally Rooney and like Madeline Miller and a lot of books that I was just seeing on Book Talk, which I think are good books, but they're not life-changing books for me. But even those books just like brought me comfort and I felt again like that joy of reading a book and feeling like you are sharing something with the soul of the narrator. And that was like reading in general. And then as time went on, I saw how my tastes changed and how when I read Dostoevsky, The Idiot, that was the first book I read that took fiction to a place I hadn't been before and I didn't know was possible. Other than that, like I can't think of very many others that were that impactful, but I've read a lot and I keep looking over at my bookshelf to see what I want to talk about. Bright Easton Ellis, um, reading Bright Easton Ellis, completely changed the way I viewed the world. I was very used to, especially when I was younger, feeling like I knew what was right, what was wrong, and I always would feel like guilt. As I got older and I like smoked weed or would drink, I just would feel shame at having fun in these ways and I felt like, oh, but I still like, 
it's still inherently bad. That's why I feel bad. And then you read Bright Easton Ellis and none of his characters ever have a thought like that. And it's not like it was a bad influence on me and made me like some hedonistic monster, but it kind of opened my mind to seeing how things can be very gray and how um, things that make us uncomfortable and that are out of the norm, that are not socially acceptable, are not just inherently bad because they are those things. Um, and when you allow yourself to stare these things in the face and take them in, a lot of times it can help you be more empathetic and more understanding of the world around you and not be so closed off in your own way of thinking. Um, so yeah, <sighs> I'm like out of breath, sorry. When I like make these videos, I'm like literally not breathing at all. So actually, those are the only questions that I received. So um, I guess to close this out, what I want to say most of all is thank you to all of you. Anybody who watches my videos and gives a fuck, I appreciate you so very much. And I really feel like seen and accepted so thank you all thank you for watching this thank you for subscribing thank you for all of the people that have signed up for my membership who have donated money to me literally thank you so much for all of your support